So good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome. As uh, president of the Geochemical Society, it is my pleasure to present the Society's honors to several distinguished scientists this afternoon. Their inspiring achievements cover a wide range of disciplines within geochemistry. First of all, we have the F.W. Clark Award, which honors a single outstanding contribution to geochemistry or cosmochemistry by an early career scientist. This medal is named after Frank Wigglesworth Clark, a chemist who lived from 1847 to 1931, and its pioneering work to explain the chemical composition of the Earth's crust. This year, the medal is being presented to Sarah Ahrens of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She is recognized for her work using novel ap applications of radiogenic and non-traditional stable isotopes systematics to identify dust sources in dust traps and ice cores, to understand mineral fractionation associated with dust transport, and to unravel the processes responsible for crustal generation at the Hadean Archean transition. So quite a wide range. Please join me in congratulating Sarah Ahrens on receiving the 2023 F.W. Clark Award. Next, we have the Claire C. Patterson Award, presented for an innovative breakthrough in environmental geochemistry of fundamental significance within the last decade, particularly in service to society. Claire Patterson had a remarkable career, during which he developed the uranium-led dating method, and in fact, the age of the Earth that we know today comes basically from him. He also played a major role in raising the awareness of the dangers of lead contamination in the environment. This year's recipient of the named medal is Myrna Simpson for the University of Toronto. She is recognized for her work that has reshaped our understanding of pollutant fate and anthropogenic impacts on biogeochemical cycling in both terrestrial and aquatic systems. Her groundbreaking research in environmental geochemistry has transformed understanding of processes controlling organic carbon and is reshaping environmental management. For these remarkable accomplishments, the Geochemical Society is delighted to present Myrna Simpson with the 2023 Claire C. Patterson Award. Please join me in congratulating her. Next, we'd like to recognize a past Patterson Award recipient after a delay of a few years because of the pandemic. Nahiro Oshida received the 2020 Award for development and application of isotopometric isotope measurements of biogeochemical studies of oceans, atmospheres, and bioelement cycling. He has developed innovative new techniques and is a leader in developing global collaborations on environmental measurements. Nahira also has a distinguished record of community service, including organization of researchers to study the dispersal of radionuclides following the Fukushima nuclear accident. And he was a member of the Goldschmidt 2016 Organic uh, Organization uh, Committee. Please join me in congratulating Nahira Oshida for the 2020 Patterson Award. Next, we have the John Hayes Award, presented by the Geochemical Society Organic Geochemistry Division to a mid-career scientist for outstanding accomplishments 
that draw mul together multiple fields of investigation to advance biogeochemical science. We are proud to recognize Aspirant Asifo Berhe, who is on leave from the University of California, Merced, to serve as director of the US Department of Energy Office of Science. She has made outstanding contributions to our understanding of the dynamics of carbon transport, stabilization in soils, from molecular to watershed scales. Her research has transformed our conceptual model of terrestrial carbon cycling by incorporating a landscape perspective, specifically geomorphology and hill slope processes into biogeochemical studies. Dr. Berhe is uh, participating remotely, so let's give her a big round of applause for the 2023 John Hayes Award. <laughs> Congratulations, Aspirate. Finally, we have the Alfred Tribes Award, also given by the Organic Geochemistry Division, for major achievements over a period of years in organic geochemistry. This year's award goes to Xu Cheng Shi of the China University of Geosciences. He is recognized for pioneering studies of geolipids for paleoclimate research, for developing uh, applications to stalagmites, paleosols, and marine sediments, and for expanding knowledge of microbial activity during major evolutionary and mass extinction events in Earth's history. He has been a leader in the development of the field of geobiology, and so we are pleased to present Dr. Shi with the 2023 Alfred Tribes Award. Thank you, everybody. And now I'd like to invite Masayo Miyami, President of the Geochemical Society of Japan, to come on stage. Hello, everyone. My name is Masayo Miyami, the President of the Geochemical Society of Japan. I would like to give a citation of 2023 Geochemical Journal Award. Geochemical Journal is a primary journal of the Geochemical Society of Japan, and we present the award upon the most outstanding research paper published in the last year based on originality, quality, and potential to contribute to the the advancement of geochemistry. So, 2023 Geochemical Journal Award is given to paper by Dr. Endo and co-authors, titled Absorption Spectral Measurement at about one Kaiser Spectral Resolution of 32, 33, 34, and 36 sulfur deoxides for the 26 and 2020 nanometer region, and application modeling of the isotopic self-sealing. It's my pleasure to present the 2023 Geochemical Journal Award to this paper. I would like to Dr. Endo to come here. Ah, come here. <laughs> Congratulations. Hello. Um, hello, everybody. Um, just before we go into uh, today's plenary lecture, I wish to remind uh, all the in-person delegates that uh, we'll have a presentation of the Geochemistry Fellows today 
at 7.30 in room five in building A, so the other half of the building. There will then be a short reception on the rooftop terrace of building A. And luckily enough, it won't be as hot as yesterday, and we hope it won't rain. So <laughs> now, I, I would now like to introduce uh, today's plenary speaker, Sumit Shakaborty, uh, who is the president of the Geochemical Society. Professor Sumit Shakaborty studied geology in India at the University of Calcutta, and, it, and then he moved to the States to do a PhD in experimental petrology at the University of Arizona. After spending few years in Beirut and Köln in Germany, he moved to the University of Bochum, where he is now the director of the Central Unit for Iron Beams and Radionuclides. Sumit is a specialist of high pressure and high temperature experimental mineralogy, and his research focuses on the understanding of the time scale and mechanism of geochemical processes. The quality of his research has been recognized by several awards, such as Fellow of the Mineral Society of America or Fellow of the Geochemical Society and European Association of Geochemistry. Today, Sumit will give the presidential lecture and he will tell us all about reading the rock record for hierarchy of time scale. So I invite Sumit to come and give his lecture. Thank you, Catherine, for the generous words. And um, thank you, everybody, for coming here. So it's a privilege and an honor to stand here and be able to address all of you. But it's also a challenge, because uh, over the past couple of years, getting the perspective of the entire society, I know what a wide range of uh, interests are represented here in the audience. And it's difficult to come up with something to say that may be uh, useful for you for an hour in a very busy conference. So what I've tried to do is to um, come up with something general. Now I need to, yeah. Yeah, we have that there. Okay, so, um, so what I'd like to do is to talk um, uh, in the first part a little bit about uh, in very general terms, and therefore it will be a little abstract and then uh, take a couple of examples to make the point. That's the outline of the talk. Now, in going around here, um, people have been asking me, uh, what do you actually mean by hierarchy of time scales? What is it all about? So let's just start with that. And I chose to use a, an image that I know, in spite of the diversity of the group here, is familiar to all of you. It's a killing curve. Now, it's a killing curve in a slightly unfamiliar representation. It's what it would look like if you were plotting it as um, an edge, so your uh, uh, present is to the left and CO2 is decreasing as you go away back in time. So if you zoom into that a little bit, what we see are oscillations in the CO2 concentration. And what you see is something happening on a time scale of T1 where CO2 concentration goes up and then down. And then, of course, if you look at it over a much longer time scale, then um, CO2 decreases in the past, or the way we are used to thinking about it, it's been increasing with time to the present. So that actually is an example of hierarchy of time scales. So the same process, you look at it on different time scales, you see different behavior. On the short time scale, you see oscillations. On the long time scale, you see a continuous increase or decrease. So how do we expect to see that in the rock record? You can see oscillations, like you see in the uh, CO2 record out there. Or you can look at uh, stop and go behavior. So that's an extreme of oscillations, if you will. And you can have spatial heterogeneity. So I'll explain what that is a little bit later in the talk. So then if you look at uh, publications in, in 
geochemical acta or chemical geology, you'll see a lot of such curves in uh, sedimentary records, in ice cores, in ocean chemistry, but not so much in the high temperature geochemistry end of things. So the first question is, do you even expect a hierarchy of time scales in high temperature processes? So let's take a look at that. So take any generic high temperature process. You can take a magma in the crust or you know, a plume coming up or something tectonic. And if you put something hot in the crust, you immediately trigger two uh, processes. You start heat transport, conduction, convection, at some rate K1 on some type scale T1, and you trigger chemical reactions on some other rate K2 on time scales T2. And both of those can go on to affect the state of stress and strain in the rocks around you because uh, conduction and convection heat is uh, associated with uh, expansion and contraction. Chemical reactions involve volume change. And change of st stress and strain can cause a lot of different effects. One would be a creation of fractures. If you do that, that in turn affects uh, conduction and convection through things like fluid flow or uh, chemical reactions as well. So that general idea actually goes back to uh, something I learned as a grad student in the course of Dennis Norton, and it's taken from an old uh, paper of his. And I've been using that since then in my teaching to tell students, you know, take your favorite outcrop and try to work out what the uh, various um, linkages are and what are the various processes uh, that influence each other. That gives you uh, quite a good understanding of um, various processes without necessarily getting into the quantitative end of things. And if you look at to do that and all of that, whatever it is that you do, in spite of the diversity of the people sitting here, everything you do relates to an interaction of thermal, mechanical, and chemical processes. And these, by definition, occur on different time scales at different rates. And therefore, not only do you expect hierarchy of time scales, you cannot avoid it. You have to have it in whatever it is that you do. So then let's go back to the killing curve again, or the modified killing curve, and ask why do we not see it in the high and low temperature records? So let's see what a killing curve, the data would look like if you're looking at it in the rock record. You would have larger uncertainties in time, in dating the rock. You'd have larger uncertainties likely in the measurement of the concentrations. And so instead of those data points, you'd have a big square or a lump. And you would not get data points every day, of course. So the second data point might look like the second square out there. And therefore, you have a lot of noise and you have a problem of sparse data sets. And the process you would infer from that data would be something like that blue arrow. So basically, anything we do, any geochemist, is we look at concentrations, we, we translate those to conditions pressure, temperature, EH, pH, whatever it is that you do. And so if you have a series of concentrations, that means you're looking at change of conditions, and that's a process. And that's how we read processes out of a rock record. Now, one way of getting a series of concentrations is from compositionally zoned minerals. So what I'm showing you here is an a image of a clinopyroxene crystals, which are where the magnesium concentration has been mapped. And all you need to know at this point is that there are a lot of different uh, shades of blue, different concentrations. So this has seen several different processes. And uh, we'll come back to this crystal later. But the point is, in a crystal like that, you, you usually have a relative sense of time if you assume that crystals grew from the core to the rim. Now, I know there are people working on crystal growth here who would be cringing at the thought because you have dendrites and things, but many crystals do grow from inside out, so let's stick to that for now. And what that means is spatially resolved analysis translates to time. So that's what you have in terms of reading the rock record from, uh, uh, reading uh, processes and time scales from the rock record. You have spatially resolved chemical analysis, you have data with uh, some constraints on time and uh, value, and not in intervals that you would necessarily desire to have. And what that means is going back to the killing curve again, that purple process is hidden. You don't see that. 
So one of the things we'd like to do, of course, is to try to find that out because you know, we would like to know as much as we can about the Earth. So if you have this situation, sparse data sets and noisy data sets, and you're trying to get information out of it, one of the things you do is you look at slopes. You look at how the value, not just the value at a point, but how the value is changing, what the gradient looks like. And that's something, again, a lot of you work on things like uh, molecular dynamics, and you use that in your uh, treatment of energy landscapes, where you look at gradients to see how the system evolves. Uh, that's used in, uh, very commonly in machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. So if you had the additional information, if you knew not just those two values, but in what direction the values change, you could say more about it. So how do you get to the gradient? The gradient on a plot where time is on the x-axis is a rate, and if you're going to do rates with chemistry, that's kinetics. So if you're going to read the rock record, your um, solid state kinetics comes into play, and that can be you know, the kinetics of reaction rates or uh, kinetics of order disorder of minerals, uh, kinetics of crystal growth and nucleation and uh, diffusion. And all of those has been used to uh, infer about time scales of uh, rocks. So diffusion is something I have worked on quite a bit, and you can get things like durations of processes. So these are not dates. This is how long or how, uh, how long was something hot or cold. Uh, looking at cooling or heating rates, ascent rates, exhumation rates, burial rates, information like that. So what can we do with that? So again, if you have those two data points, and now I've moved away from the Keeling curve. This is now a generic process with uh, something on the y-axis, something time value on the x-axis. And if you have those two data points, you would like to know what the slope is and what can you do with that. So an example of that is this uh, very recent paper from Shampriti Boshak. She was a PhD student. Uh, uh, this paper just came out in Journal of Petrology looking at uh, metamorphic Archean rocks. And from doing thermometry, barometry, and everything, so now I have put numbers on the y-axis, that's temperature and time. And she had information on stage one and stage three, but she also knew that, uh, let me get the laser pointer on here. She also knew the slope here, and that enabled her to say that there's a process between stage one and stage three, there's a residence at low temperatures for long times, and that has implications for the style of early earth plate tectonics and tectonic processes. So that's an example from an early earth process, and the paper is out, so I, you can, I invite you to read that and look into it. This applies also to uh, more recent processes, of course, and here the scheduling hasn't quite played to my hand because this is a talk at this meeting that happened just before this plenary. Otherwise, I'd have told you to go listen to it. So the, the abstract's there, and the first author is around, so you can uh, ask the person. And one of the real strengths of these tools are that uh, the resolution of these tools do not depend on the age of the rocks. If you can resolve a few years or 100,000 years uh, in a rock that formed today, you can do the same thing in a rock that's uh, in a meteorite that's four and a half billion years old. Okay, so I will talk about a couple of examples from my own research that I'm doing right now to give you the examples. But before I do that, I'd like to pause for a minute and, and step back and uh, look at some general aspects. So I did my, as you heard, I did my, um, my formative academic periods were spent in Arizona. So these are two iconic images of time scales from uh, Arizona. So on your left, you see, um, the Grand Canyon, the ultimate example of deep time, a uh, rock record of hundreds of millions of years, all staring at you. And on your right, you see the meteor crater. If there's anything in geology that's instantaneous, that's it, okay? And that, of course, was the essence of the, one of the major debates in geosciences, uniformitarianism versus catastrophism. And we, of course, know that that led to the um, finding of deep time, and I personally think actually at the turn of the millennium when 
people who are talking about the 10 major achievements of humanity, I think that counts as one of those because that, along with the uh, astronomical work of William Herschel at about the same time, changed the view of time scales in Western science and philosophy. So that's very important. We can deal with millions and billions of years, but that has a bit of a boomerang effect as well. Because what ends up happening is, you know, I went to, I went to a conference just two weeks ago with, uh, with physicists and material scientists, and they said, oh, what you do is very exciting, but, you know, that happens over millions and billions of years, and we have many problems today and tomorrow and day after. Uh, you know, I mean, we, that can wait. And the same sort of thinking goes into a lot of uh, climate change discussion. You know, people recognize, there's many people recognize, most people recognize there is a problem with climate change, but the urgency of action gets lost because people tend to think, oh, it's something geological, it's, it's you know, long time scale. And the point is, you know, we do deal with millions and billions of years, but we also deal with days and decades and years. And that's, I think, very important to communicate to the community and tell, tell the people. So with that, let's get to decades. Let's go to some example uh, in Europe. So let's look at some European volcanoes. So what you see here are a few of the major European volcanoes. Now, Santorini in Crete was last active, not active, but you know, showed seismic activity, um, uh, ground deformation in 2011-12. Uh, IFL Jökull in Iceland famously shut down air traffic at, in 2010. Eiffel had uh, seismic activities in 2017 and 18. I'll show you more of that in a minute. Down in the south, in southern Italy, you have a series of volcanoes, all of which could potentially uh, erupt. So if you look at this night view of Naples, uh, what you see are those dark spots, many of those dark spots surrounded in purple uh, lines. And those are all volcanoes with all having the potential to erupt. And uh, on the top, you see a red line that actually is a part of the boundary of Campo Flegri. It extends out further to the west. Now, um, and when it does erupt, if it does erupt, uh, this is what it could look like. That's 1944 Vesuvius with Naples in the foreground. So if that, something like that were going to happen, it'd be nice to have some warning if you could do something about it. And if you're thinking of social acceptance, this is a slide that I like to pick up and show. So it's kind of silly to come to a geochemist conference and use your source uh, financial times, but, <laughs> What they did was they did this analysis, which I'm not an expert on Fuji, I can't vouch for the accuracy of it, but they came up with a number of $32 billion and that made them sit up enough to not only do a research and publish an article on that. So um, let's go and see if we can sort of do something to provide some warnings. So this is Pulvermar, this is in Eiffel, this is the model storybook Mar. Uh, that blue lake is a crater, and around that you have the crater rim. And what Mars are is shown in this slide here, which is what, you know, it's a tourist area. You can, you can go walk around, and if you see, you see signboards if you walk around. And this is what you would be reading out there. And so it says, Mars are formed by powerful explosions caused when rising hot magma meets groundwater. What you also see is it's written by um, Hans Ulrich Schminke, who's a big giant in the field of volcanology. Uh, what you see on the top, you know, I have not highlighted it quite, said that you know, he, uh, he and their colleagues showed that the prevailing doctrine formed by CO2 explosions was not consistent with the evidence found in the field. This was 1970s. Okay, so what does it look like? This is uh, from the PhD thesis of Anche Duda back in 1985 with uh, Hans Schminke. And the idea was what she found out was that these smells form in the mantle, come up and actually stall or are stored in mid crust somewhere at 20 kilometers, and then comes up and interacts with uh, water and forms those Mars. Now I've gone back and, and you can do a lot more on barometry. I've checked it out with modern tools. It's a very difficult rock to do barometry on because this is rich in iron 3 plus, has got a lot of sodium, so you get a lot of noise, but the results are still, you know, you have a stalling depth of 10 to 20 kilometers. And that actually gives you a question. You know, if you are making this melt in a mantle, stalling this at 10 to 20 kilometer, kilometer depth, 
And to erupt, you have to interact with groundwater, which goes down maybe maximum to five kilometers. You have to have a way of bringing it up from the mid-crystal depths to, to, uh, to um, interaction with the groundwater. And that pyroxene crystal that I was talking about earlier actually is from this area. And uh, what that tells you is that the real history is a lot more complex than uh, simply you know, forming at one place, stalling at a second place, and then uh, erupting. Okay? So that was all known you know, for quite some time. But what happened was uh, the seismologists saw some signals back in 2017 and 18. So on the right panel, in the middle of the box, you see those red symbols. Those are earthquakes that occurred there in 2017, 18, and that literally shook people up. People wanted to sit up and know if something's going to happen. Okay, so Eiffel is between Frankfurt, Cologne, and Brussels, and if something's going to happen out there, it'd be good to get some warning ahead of time. And those earthquakes were low-frequency earthquakes, so those are the kinds of earthquakes you get when, when there's movement of melt or fluids. So let's go to the field and look at it. And so this is the, um, the crater wall of that Uvermar. And what you're seeing on those images is uh, zooming in pro progressively at one point, shown with the pen. Uh, and ultimately, you get to the bottom right panel where you are zooming in and looking at some round objects. Now, before I get to that, what I'd like to <laughs> point out here is that the person on the uh, image at the bottom with the orange hat, tiny uh, image, is uh, Hans Ulrich Schminke. And so he's way past retirement. He's in his mid-80s. And uh, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about actually comes ideas that come from him. And then I'm working with him and Sumita Mari and Tor Hanstein. But he's working very hard to undo what he had said in 1970, that CO2 doesn't play any role. As you will see now, you know, we are talking about CO2 does play a role. So I find that very admirable and commendable that someone in 85 can sit down and has no hesitation in working hard to undo something that they emphatically said back in 1970. Okay, so what are those round objects? Let's take a close look. I mean, you could think of you know, things like lithic fragments, accretionary lapilli, but these are quite special. So if you look at those objects, these are like round objects coated with lava. And on panel B up there, what you see are some sediments coated with lava, but I'd like to draw your attention to the right column there, which are a set of plutonic rocks coated with some lava. And I've zoomed out one in the bottom, and on the right bottom, you see uh, uh, cross polar views of the thin section of that rock. So what you see is, that first of all, it's, it's kind of like a, like a great visual depiction of hierarchy of time scales. You have plutonic rocks, very slow cooling, coated with a lava, a very bubble-rich lava that will become relevant, which is um, um, quenched and cooled very rapidly. So one of the features is that the composition of that lava and the plutonic rocks are very similar. They're melilith nephilinites, which are very silica-poor, um, alkali-rich uh, melts. And so then the question is, you know, how do you take the same melt, same uh, composition, and crystallize that very slowly for a while, and then you um, coat it with a lava that gets quenched very quickly? And an idea of fluidized beds is useful, and let me sort of explain to you what that is. So on the top row there, what you see are, um, uh, as an explanation of fluidized beds, that's a concept that's very widely used in chemical engineering and in material science, and it's been used in other contexts in volcanology as well. So what you have is a uh, packed bed of powders, and if you stream some gas from the um, bottom, that the powder thing starts to get disturbed and moved out, and as you increase the flux, increase the, the velocity, then it can start churning the things around and, and then ultimately coating the particles with some layer. So a lot of medicine that you take with a coating on it is produced that way. And then if you keep increasing the gas flux, you know, you, you, the velocity, it just takes the whole thing out of the system. So our thinking is something like that. We have been going on with those uh, plutonic rocks. We have a 
that mid-crustal sill, if you will, of uh, where the rock or the melt, or a mush zone, melt plus rock is uh, residing. And then if you bring in a new pulse of um, volatile charged melt, that would do exactly that kind of thing. That would first you know, disrupt the layer, then start spinning it around and pretty could produce those uh, coatings out there. And then, you know, if the rate is high enough, it could carry it up. And if it comes to the shallower depths, then it can interact with water and produce those, those mars. So you are looking at a process that's happening before the mar formation process. So now that would be interesting if you could get a time scale on that. But before we do that, the interesting question is, do you have a volatile, a gas, to do that? And turns out the answer is yes. So to make these kinds of melts in the mantle, you need about 5% CO2, a lot of CO2. There's a lot of phase equilibrium experiments which uh, point to that. And then if you bring it up, you can calculate how much CO2 remains dissolved at those mid-crustal depths. And you can do that using a number of different uh, tools uh, which I've listed on the uh, bottom there that vesicle program itself has seven different ways of calculating it. And you can do an open system, a closed system, but no matter what you do, you end up with um, between six and three kilobars because the barometry was uncertain, you know, between 10 and 20 kilometers, you'll have about two to three weight percent CO2. So if you have a rock formed with five weight percent CO2 and if you bring it up there, you'd be losing about half of it. So you'd be giving out a lot of CO2 out there. So that is the potential to make such a fluidized bed. So how long does it last? Let's go and look at this um, rock record now. The, this is a backscattered electron image on the top of the plutonic nodule coated with the fine-grained lava. And from that, I've picked out one particular section with um, olivine and a clinopyroxene. I've looked at many of these, of course. I'm showing you one example. And if you uh, look at that, let me get the laser pointer again along a line kind of like that across here, okay? And measure concentration profiles, magnesium. What you see is that you have a pyroxene one on which uh, pyroxene two is forming uh, during this coating process. And you have an olivine on which a second olivine is forming from the new lava thing. And what you see is that the uh, boundary between the pyroxenes are extremely sharp. So they haven't had, even though they're hot, these are two different compositions sitting in a lava at hot temperature. They did not have time to diffuse or, or mix properly. But olivine, where diffusion is a little bit faster, uh, did have the chance to do that. And that you see in a zoomed out inset where you see a profile which you can then model. And the same uncertainty that you have with the depths, you have with the temperature as well. But you know, because this is a liquid, a lot of liquid, it had to be somewhere between 900 and 1200 degrees centigrade. And if you take that, then it turns out to make that olivine diffusion profile, if you take 1200 degrees, you take about two weeks, 14 days. If you take the lower end, uh, the uh, 900 degree temperature, it takes about a year. And if you go up to 950 or 1000, you know, diffusion goes exponentially. So that boils down to a few weeks. So basically what it tells you is that uh, before you go up and interact with the, the groundwater and make this uh, mar, what happens is uh, you have a mid-crustal process where you um, make a fluidized mid, make this lava coating, and that lasts about a couple of weeks to a few months. And if you had a process like that going on in the mid-crust, you would get seismic signals, you would get CO2 degassing, you would get a lot of warning, and that would be uh, quite helpful. I think you can go and talk to politicians with that piece of information. Okay, so if you're doing uh, magma chambers, let's look at it a in a little bit more detail. So um, the concept of a magma chamber has been overhauled in a big way now, so we now don't think of a big magma chamber in the crust anymore. So on the left, what you see is an image of a transcrustal uh, magma reservoir, the kind of thing people, this is from a uh, very well cited paper by Kathy Cashman, John Blundy, and Steve Sparks, where you sh show little sills which are zones of um, partially molten regions connected by vertical dikes, and they're not all hot and molten at the same time. Things move along between them. And so, in a later paper, uh, Jackson, Blundy, and Sparks uh, 
sort of model that quantitatively, and what they found was that if you put in uh, magma in a crust, cold crust, it'll just die, it'll just chill and then freeze out. So what you have to do is to put in pulses of magma coming in, and that kind of warms up the surrounding crust, and ultimately you can make such a sill. So given that, what we did was we said, okay, we'll take their model, and we go in and, and calculate what the uh, temperature distribution looks like. So the depth at which you make the pulses, you of course see the thermal pulses, that's at eight kilometers, the steep brown pulses. And above and below that at different depths, those are described in the legend, the pulses die out. But what you see is uh, thermal histories that look very different, okay? And that's what I meant by spatial heterogeneity in, in time scales. And if the thermal histories are different, then the rock record in the crystals are going to be different. So the question is, you know, do we see that somewhere? And turns out, fortuitously, that I have an example. This is uh, um, Ya Jing Li, which he was visiting from the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Bochum right now. And we were, he, he works on nickel um, copper deposits associated with gabbros uh, in the northwest of China in this case. And what you see at the bottom is a, is a, is a um, cross section where um, taken two um, samples, blue stars, and if you take those samples and look at their uh, olivines, what you see is one olivine, uh, an element concentration map on the top, the olivine concentration map in the bottom from the other sample, and a bunch of different concentration profiles. So, you know, things that diffuse slowly on the left, phosphorus, uh, chrome, aluminum, uh, things that diffuse a little bit faster on your right, iron, magnesium, nickel, and so on. And the main point I want to make here is that those look very different. You know, that's a busy slide, we don't need to look at that. The point is to look at the top one and the bottom one and the concentration profiles look very different. But the red lines are model fits. So you can actually model and fit them. So um, the time scales come out to be decades or so in that scale. And I leave it at that because Ia Jing should talk about that and I don't want to steal his thunder. But uh, what I'd also like to point out is that there are some magnesium and iron isotopic data profiles in there done in Hannover with Martin Weiser and Stefan Bayer, and that shows that these profiles are indeed diffusion profiles. Okay, so I've talked about olivine, talked about time scales, volcanoes, and those are you know, good stories to tell, but all of these stories actually stand on some important um, basement. And we end up you know, in this sort of high profile talks not to talk about the details that the experimental work that goes behind all of this work that comes. And I think that should change. And so this is what kind of goes behind those uh, data that you're looking at. So this is a tool called Pulse Laser Deposition, uh, PLD, which is used quite commonly in material science, but in geosciences, I believe there's only one in Bochum. But we've had that for 20 years now and a lot of people have come and used it. What you do there is you're looking, those images are in a vacuum chamber, you're looking at a glass disc here at the bottom, uh, which you call a substrate, another disc here on the top, which you call a target, and if you hit the target with a laser, you get a plasma, which then takes the material from the target and deposits it on the, uh, on the glass disc there. And what you produce, so this particular image happens to be from the, uh, a paper that Thilo Bisport wrote out of his PhD thesis, but the instrument's been there for 20 years. And what you get are things like that. So on your left, you're seeing a thin film of an olivine on an olivine of two different compositions. And uh, the scale is about 100 nanometers. And these are very easy to produce, very quick to produce, very flexible. You can produce all kinds of minerals. and. Uh, uh, so that has opened up things that you do in diffusion studies that you couldn't do before. And the right image shows you an SEM image. You don't see anything in that image, and that actually is exactly the point. The surface is extremely smooth. It has a roughness of plus or minus one nanometers. So with that, what you can do is, if, because diffusion scales as a square root of time, if you have a natural process that happens at um, for about 100,000 years and gives you a profile of 100 micrometers, you can actually do the exact same experiments, conditions in the lab for three days and get a 100 nanometer profile and study that. You don't have to extrapolate. And that meant that we could collect a lot more diffusion data. This is iron magnesium diffusing olivine, 
as one example. And uh, again, you know, it's a product of a lot of different uh, PhD and postdoc work. And I think those people need to get some credit because they delivered the material that actually enables to do what I've been talking about earlier today. So uh, the, particularly I'd like to point out that between 1,000 and 1,200 degrees, you have an extreme density of data. That's the conditions at which I was modeling the things, I was doing the things, so you don't have any extrapolation. You're not doing any, any uh, uncertain um, extrapolations there. Okay, to wrap it up, I just uh, go to something very different uh, on a very different time scale, very different spatial scale, uh, mountain building. Uh, this is older work. This is published work. The reason I'm picking it up here again is because it kind of fits in with the whole, whole discussion that we've been having. So um, there's this debate about channel flow versus critical taper. And what it is, is I think it goes back to uh, Lee Royden back in the 1980s where she said that if you have a mountain building and if you have hot rocks uh, um, at depth, they are also soft. And if you are squeezing uh, the area, then those soft rocks would flow like a channel at lower to middle crust, okay? And then, you know, from that, uh, and that was been checked by many different geodynamic modeling, Chris Bumont and many others, we ourselves as well. Um, but then came the idea that, well, you know, something like the Himalaya, you have a monsoon, you have a lot of erosion, there's a lot of mass that's going away from the surface, and that would kind of suck up things from the bottom and could you know, affect channel flow. There's a connection between the two. And that led to a very, very uh, controversial debate. And I read through all of that, and it turns out that all of the people who are saying we don't see any evidence of that, we see block tectonics, we don't see such channels, where sedimentary geologists, low temperature thermochronologists, uh, geomorphologists, everybody in blue who look at low temperature processes. And people who said uh, we see signatures of channel flow where metamorphic petrologists, geodynamic modelers, people are looking at hot rocks. So we went to Sikkim in Eastern Himalaya, and uh, unlike the other work, this was a big teamwork with a lot of people in a lot of different disciplines that went and worked together. So um, it was actually 11 people, I counted, a football team. Uh, the outcome of that was this. This is the one point I want to make um, from that um, uh, study. So there's a series of papers that came out. So what you see on the right is uh, pressure temperature uh, history. So uh, that was done with phase diagram calculations. You can do uh, kinetically controlled thermobarometry. You can do individual reactions. And all of those give you a consistent picture that you have a rock getting buried, rock getting exhumed without much cooling, isothermal decomposition for the metamorphic petrologists here. And then you had uh, cooling without much uh, uh, exhumation for a while. That's um, isobaric cooling for the metamorphic petrologists here. One important point is the metamorphic rock record stops at about 500 degrees. Not much happens after that in terms of metamorphism in those rocks. So we took that and put that up in the diagrams on your left, your temperature time diagram on the top, and. Uh, depth time diagram on the bottom. And what you see is that uh, I've highlighted the part in red, which is the part we get from the slope that we get from this diffusion modeling. And what you see there is if you took that and extrapolated that back to the surface, the rocks would not be on the surface. This is Himalaya, that's a big advantage you know that the rocks would still be hot and they would not be at the surface today. So you know immediately that something else had to have happened. And that something else is um, faulting and block tectonics. That, uh, so what we did was we went and took this study from Kellet et al., that's not our study, and spliced it together with the work that uh, we had done. And what came out of that was, uh, yes, you have a history of continuous cooling and, and exhumation, but you have a hierarchy of time scales. You have an oscillatory process, different processes interacting with each other. So the simplest way I find of explaining that is this picture of my son from long ago playing with this toy. So if you tug at this thread on top, you move the small wheel there, and that in turn moves the big wheel. So yes, the thread does affect the wheel below. The processes on top does affect 
channel flow, but not direct. You have something in between. And what you need to do is, you know, that's why I took the formal definition of a system and I put it out there, a combination of elements intended to act together to accomplish an objective. Earth is a system, it works together, doesn't care about high temperature, low temperature, connects it all together, and I think we as geochemists should too. So my conclusion is actually very simple, this image. So I think most processes that you look at, again, in spite of the diversity of group that we have here, look something like that. You have time scales T1, T2, T3 that are involved in whatever it is that you are studying. And kinetics provides a window of looking into that because those slopes give you important information. So if you do that, you can discover new processes. You can address existing debates, if you, which you saw an example. And in particular, the hidden processes at the shorter end of the time scale are uh, very, very useful for uh, communicating with um, people for the relevance of our science into society and, um, of course, also for funding. And I'd I urge all of you to think about that, do that, and see what you can do to look at the shorter end of the time scale. So do millions and billions of years, but also look at the other end of it. Thank you. Thanks, Sumit. That was a really nice talk. Uh, before we go into the uh, uh, in, uh, in for questions, um, I would like uh, to mention that the people who uh, registered for the uh, mid the plenary lunch uh, should uh, come. If they are in the room here, they should come by the, the end of the stage there, at the end of the question, and we'll go together to the room where the event will happen. So now let's move to the questions. I have difficulty to see if there is somebody somewhere. <laughs> is there anything there? No. OK. Huh? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, so maybe I ask a first question. <laughs> uh, I'm just, uh, you know, just thinking back of what you said about uh, the Eiffel uh, volcano. I mean, the Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, did you look at who, who, you know, the process that are uh, going on in uh, next to Napoli in the? The, the, not the Vesuvio, but the other yeah. parts. Campe, the, Campe, yeah. Campe yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. And yeah. so? It, it's um, different in the sense those are silicic volcanics. Yeah. Uh, but um, so I instead of the, the um, um, uh, fluidized bed and then coating with lava, what you have there is um, magma mixing. Uh -huh. but, uh, but you have the overall pattern is very similar, that you have something happening at mid-crustal depths, and then you bring things up, and, and you erupt, and you get time scales again of days, weeks, and months. So there's a paper that came out in Geochemica about a year ago, and we we're working on a couple others. Yeah, Yeah. OK. But uh, uh, maybe predicting it uh, accurately enough to tell the population of Napoli to get away, it yeah. might be a, a still in tricky. the dream. <laughs> I don't want to be in that position. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy to say the time scale and then let yeah. people do what they want to do Absolutely. with that. Absolutely. So we have a question here in the, in the room. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Sumit, for a great talk. Um, I have a quite technical question. So this pulse laser heating device that you introduced, it, where, where you coat one olivine layer onto the next, I'm wondering if the crystal structure of the coated material that is kind of forming in that plasma and then being deposited. Does that actually have the olivine crystal structure just like below, and how come? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a 
detail that I didn't get into. So what I showed you, the, the layer as deposited is actually amorphous. But what you do is then you uh, heat it and it does crystallize to olivine. And we've looked at it at uh, very high resolution TEM and you actually have lattice planes growing across the boundary into the uh, coating in the film. However, the film is polycrystalline, so it's a very dense nanocrystalline olivine, but with the same structure as the olivine um, the, uh, on the substrate, yeah. And do you think that does uh, that difference in micro or nano structure of these crystals doesn't actually affect the time scales? Because olivine has kind of different diffusion time scales in different crystallographic directions. Oh, it does. But, I mean, and that was determined actually using those kinds of films. So um, the diffusion coefficients you measure are inside the single crystal, and there you have only one direction, of course. Okay, thank you. So the, the film acts as a source for your diffusion experiment. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Uh, hi, Shumit. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. Thanks a lot. Thank I enjoyed you. especially the philosophical background of it. Uh, my question would be, uh, with these uh, predictions of the events that you mentioned, uh, your time scale ranged from two weeks until one year, uh, depending on the temperature from 1200 to 900. Would you see any way how to constrain it better? Uh, I mean, the temperature which in turn would uh, somehow narrow this interval of time. Okay, so Thanks. the first thing I want to say is if you had n I carefully avoided the word prediction. I don't want to say prediction. So I said warnings and things like that. So um, yes, and actually um, for the pressure determination as well as the temperature determination, what we need is um, phase equilibrium experiments in those compositions. Those are very iron three rich, sodium rich compositions and, and you don't have much data. So actually we are trying to write a proposal right now to do such phase equilibrium experiments and hopefully constrain those better. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. We have a question on the other side. Uh, hi, Shumit. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, in your olivine uh, zoning modeling, how did you incorporate uh, the growth and dissolution? So, which is the uh, uh, process, a kinetic process that is uh, controlled by different process, different mechanisms. Right. So, in that particular case, there is no um, dissolution. So, it's happening. So, you have an old olivine sitting there on which a new one is getting plated on very quickly. And the assumption there was that the growth of that olivine was um, faster on the time scale of diffusion. So you have a new olivine plated on quickly and then you have diffusion between the two. Is that the assumption? That's an assumption, yes. Thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm thinking about the sedimentary record and the Sadler effect that we see uh, which results from the unsteady nature of the sedimentary record and self-erasing processes. I think this gets to the questions of dissolution and reprecipitation that we just heard about. I I'd love to hear your thoughts on those and how they can affect our ability to assess the hierarchy of timescales. Well, I would hesitate to say anything much about sedimentary records, but uh, what you can do, or what, what I do know is that uh, when you model these things, uh, uh, in many situations, you do have to take the reaction term into account. And the moment you bring into it, that into it, you have reaction plus diffusion, you have a set of hierarchy going right there between a competition between the reaction, you know, growth, the dissolution term, and the diffusion term. And actually, one of the real nuisances in the whole thing is that uh, you can produce something like a steady state with that, which is, you know, it becomes time independent. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to de determine time scales. That's not what you want to happen, but that's a possibility. So yeah, so you can model those things using a reaction diffusion equation, and that has a much richer behavior than just a diffusion equation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah? Thank you, Sumit. Um, just from the, my recollection from some old days, if you have the, the thickness of the thermal boundary layer in metamorphic series is essentially defined by the picklet number, which is the, the ratio of the diffusion to, uh, to the um, advection, essentially. One way of, uh, uh, of addressing the issue of, 
of channel flow, uh, which is going to actually split the thermal flux into a lateral component and a vertical component, uh, it should be easily visible uh, in, the, in the heat flow, in the, in the gradient, in metamorphic gradient, in the metamorphic series, if we have a channel flow, which is not the case for the other model. Um, first of all, yeah, I mean, I learned about that from 1972, Alvarez Botinga, so <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> um, the, one of the big problems with the, with the um, detailed modeling of the channel flow thing is, so when you model these things, you're looking at a much coarser system, but uh, all of these, the volcanic system, the Himalayan system, you don't have a body of, large body of melt at depth because that will just get squeezed out. So what you have are these mush zones. So you have a crystal melt um, two-phase um, system, and that becomes very difficult to model if you are doing a big geodynamic model. So that's really where the challenge is, to, to tie in a grain scale um, mush model with a big geodynamic model. So there are people um, who do the modeling are trying to develop that. And yeah, if they get there, then those would be things that one would like to do. Yeah, but, but with a little bit of uh, uh, metamorphic petrology and geochronology, we should be able to define this peclet number for the series and well, figure yeah. out. Okay. The, the, the bulk peclet number, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, no question remotely? No, nobody. Uh, nobody in the room wants to ask a question anymore? Okay, so we're going to thank the speaker and uh, we can all go for lunch. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>